Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Gotham City. I'm your host, Levy Rosman. This is a podcast where I talk to people who live in the chess world on the 64 squares and beyond them. For this episode, my guest is Sagar Shah. He's an international master. He is the face of Chessbase India, which is a company and also a YouTube channel that has about 6,000 videos. He's a pioneer of chess content, particularly from the journalistic standpoint. He has traveled the entire country of India, scouting all top chess talent, and he is deeply involved in the culture and the progress of chess in India. And I'm so excited for this episode, and I hope you'll enjoy it. I was telling you before we recorded, but now I want to tell you on the record for everybody to hear that I am incredibly impressed with the fact that you woke up this early. It is currently 7 in the morning over there. Uh, and I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked you off air, which is why? Why are you here? So <laughs> this, this, is, this is not my background. Yeah, yeah you're I, not at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the thing is that uh, as the day goes on, uh, I tend to, you know, it's uh, the way I work is not very planned way. Like I don't have my schedule written down. So as the day goes on, things turn up and I start doing things. And uh, one thing leads to another and maybe do it in the evening. I might not be fresh. And so I thought, well, morning is the best time uh, to wake up and, you know, have nothing on my mind uh, for this, you know, podcast. So I thought it's the best time. That is interesting. I I'll say that a couple of things. So I, if I ever feel anxious or wound up or I'm thinking of things at night, I always know sleep is like the, the, the killer of this, at least for me. So far, knock on wood, I, nothing really keeps me awake too much. So I'll wake up in the morning and I'll be really like, oh, it's a new day. It's sunny outside. They say anxiety is always worse when it's dark and it's late night. Mm -hmm. So, right. but for, for me, man, I need coffee and I need sometimes like two a day. I'm not at the level of three and four, but you told me something crazy. I want you to say that again. <laughs> you don't drink any coffee like at all ever. Yeah. I mean, uh, I can drink if someone offers me and mm. there's nothing else, but uh, I have never uh, gotten into the habit of you know waking up and needing a drink like coffee or tea or any ca caffeine because uh, when I was growing up as a chess player I was very ambitious uh, and I wanted to be one of the best and at that point when I read whatever would help me become better at chess I would take it very seriously like if there were words by Botwinik, Kasparov, uh, Fisher, Anand, whatever I, I read. And I read that Fisher said, you shouldn't drink, uh, chess player should not drink uh, caffeine because it stimulates your brain. And mm -hmm. when you actually want it to go into like a higher uh, plane, like you should in your top form, then if you don't get it, what would you do? So uh, I kind of found it sensible. And I said, okay, uh, why should I let my brain be, you know, dependent upon <laughs> on, on those things? So. That is a very fair point. I never drank caffeine and I think, or coffee, I should, I always drank tea, but ne never to give me the boost. And I remember, I remember when it happened for me, I remember it was college and it was late night and I was studying for final exams and I had a Turkish coffee. I don't know if you've mm. ever had Turkish coffee. It's like special. They make it in this yeah. beautiful pot. Yeah. And uh, oh my God, man. Like from zero coffee to Turkish coffee. I mean, it felt like just a punch in my brain. And, and I was super locked in. And then I drank a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. But probably streaming. Streaming is what destroyed my... Uh, like uh, when I was first starting streaming in 2018, I would come home after a day of teaching chess, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And I would stream till 4 in the morning. And mm. I would be so dead the next morning that I said, oh, let me try coffee. And it worked. But unfortunately, <laughs> here we are three years later, uh, yeah. super addicted. But, I mean, uh, yeah, this about caffeine, but just from what you said, I mean, I've been following you, what you're doing since a year and so, and it's just very amazingly impressive how you have built up stuff and uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, congratulations to you. I mean, it's amazing what you have achieved. Well, I first of all, thank you. But Sagar, I have to say, when I when I look at you, first of all, do you remember the text message I sent you? Yes, yes. I. Uh, you, <laughs> you still know, have the thing it? Is, the thing is, when I was going to write back to you, uh -huh. uh, I thought I don't have your number. So I asked Samai, 
to give me your number mm-hmm. uh, and then when he sent it and i uh, wrote on whatsapp i saw oh oh this message had come like a year ago and i i had forgotten about it really uh, yes uh, it was like you had written to me that uh, if there are any commentary yeah. you know uh, opportunities in india or something like that then let me know and yeah. uh, i i had i didn't remember because after the, after you wrote i think the pandemic struck like yeah very soon yeah 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 so january february march 2020 even before yeah. covid was a crazy time in my life very negative time in my life and i i when we launch this episode of the podcast the episode with eric rosen will be live already but i have a few that i've recorded i haven't put out yet at the time of recording but in that episode i mentioned that there was a moment in march that everything could have went wrong in my life or or basically like what we have now and i made a few decisions to get better at as a person and some habits and everything and without going into crazy detail like my path went to the right instead of to the left um so when i contacted you i was in like a mid crisis like i didn't exactly know what my next career move was going to be i was not streaming i had no youtube channel and i was reaching out to uh, tournaments to to get uh-huh. commentary roles for 2020 and I decided to contact you even though we had like never spoken. I mean, I at that point I was watching many of your interviews which we'll talk about later. Uh and I thought, "Hey, this guy is like well connected. He's at a lot of European tournaments. Maybe there will be an opportunity." And yeah, then the pandemic happened and I only thought about this message like recently, you know? And I kind of was like, "That's that's so wild." And you responded. You responded. Yeah, I'm not saying you didn't re- I'm saying you responded and you said if there anything comes up, I'll let you know, but did you even You must have not even known who I like I was just a random person probably right at that point like I I did have to google uh, you know uh, because I hadn't heard of Levi Rosman at that point but I think uh, awesome. many <laughs> it, it, it's true about many people yeah, who are yeah, watching yeah. this as well they got to know you in the last year and a half well you you were very complimentary of like my journey and everything but it it If I'm being honest, I I look at you as the the face of online chess. You represent an entire country. I might represent chess and and I have viewers in New York City or I have viewers, but it 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 must feel different Sagar to be like the representative of online chess content for a nation and a quite a large nation. Like do do you feel that sometimes you walk around like is that how did that happen? How how did you this whole journey with chess base india you have like almost 6000 youtube videos it's not close if you combine all the other chess channels on youtube we we're not even close so you talk about my work ethic you 6000 videos <laughs> so how 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 like uh, how did you how did you get here is what i want to know and we can talk about your playing career but how did you get here like where where we are now i think uh, mainly it's like the best thing about uh, what i realized that i do is i like to share so the thing is that wherever i was going to tournaments even when i was playing i felt like whenever something nice happened not just with me as a chess player but with anyone like someone mm. played a great game or someone won something or someone gave an advice or there was something nice happening some nice arrangements made by the tournament organizer i always like to take pictures or videos and share it on my youtube channel i also had my own personal blog so i i loved sharing and somehow i didn't understand that that was the reason why things would you know scale up very quickly and when i reached uh, the world cup which was a breakthrough event for chess base india in 2017 uh i had a camera and a microphone and amruta was there and together we would you know follow all the games and mm-hmm. the instant any chess player would come out we would interview him and it didn't matter if it was an indian if he was a top player like we had interviews with all sorts of players there and people were who wanted to follow the world cup realized that okay chess base india is the best place to get any interviews here um and so i think it all started very randomly like i would take interviews i would put it up mm-hmm. then later on i realized that okay they are talking about chess moves and i need to record ah. the analysis which they say mm-hmm. and i think at that point hardly anyone used to do it um there was peter doggers from chess.com yeah. who used to put in that effort and i started doing it diligently like for every interview because otherwise it made no sense and i i mm-hmm. and uh, 
I think people also enjoyed that, uh, that they could follow. And there were many chess questions which I could ask, which not many others could. I think slowly it started growing. And um, I think mainly it was this uh, ability to share with people what I felt. Oh, look, Aronian made this mm -hmm. amazing move. And after the game, Levon, why did you play this? And mm -hmm. uh, if you would say, I was very happy uh, to know that. I'm, I have so many questions I want to ask, but there was a burning one I wanted to ask, almost on a humorous side of things. Were you ever a little uncomfortable, like trying to interview players after games or, or you thought they wouldn't want to talk to you? Chess players are not the friendliest people. Levon, for example, is really friendly, but I feel like many of them, they don't want to be bothered. So was that ever a challenge for you to have to interview them? Yeah, like when I went to the candidates uh, mm -hmm. in 2016, which was maybe one of my first huge, like the biggest event that I covered uh, in the starting days as a reporter, I used to feel very uh, apprehensive mm -hmm. going towards players. I used to feel like, you know, what would they tell me if I asked them a question? But there were certain players who, who made me feel very comfortable. Like one of them was Anish Giri. Uh, and, you know, he was, <laughs> he, he, I didn't know him back then and not at all. And in fact, uh, he just saw me and Amruta covering the event he was playing. I think that was this famous event where he had 14 draws uh -huh, uh, yeah. and uh, I was there in uh, Moscow and he used to talk uh, about his games. Also, Sergei Karyakin was very, very patient giving interviews who won that event, you know, yep. uh, and so slowly I realized that yes, although that although there are emotions after the game for, for players, I think it's very important to talk to them. Like, for example, I remember there was this touch and move incident that happened between Hikaru and Aronian over there, which was yeah. which became very uh, well known. And I managed to ask Hikaru about that incident, you know, like, oh, did you touch what happened there? And he spoke about it. Like the thing is, if you always feel scared to ask about yeah. such questions, but when you do, sometimes they do respond. And I think uh, as a journalist, I grew uh, there that if you ask the questions, yes, you will have a ratio of hit uh, and you might, some people may not like it and they mm -hmm. may not answer. But uh, if you think it's important, then you should ask it. Yeah, completely fair. I 100% agree with you because as a spectator before the past like three years, let's say, before uh, maybe two, two years, chess players almost feel like they kind of have like an incubate, the top chess players, they have kind of an incubated environment on which they play. Once you break into the top, the invitations and you play all these closed events, um, chess is not the kind of sport which requires you to be popular in interviews. It's not like mixed martial arts, where if you talk trash, you're gonna sell more pay-per-views, then you're gonna get more sponsors. These guys have to say nothing. Some of them say nothing most of their career. Yeah. They just, right? So, and then when the interview is required of them, they talk about the game. Like, you, they will come out, you know, whereas uh, guys like Anish can talk to you about anything. They'll talk to you about how they felt, their emotions, and nowadays, uh, for example, the, the, the broadcast team for the Champions Chess Tour uh, with Yovanka, with David, with, with Kaya, they won't even say squares. I don't know if you noticed that. Like, they, they describe the position, yeah. which, like, that is how you would attract more people to the game. But I think, the, would you agree that there's sort of a problem because the top players, they don't necessarily need a massive global audience because they have that already a system in place where all the top players already sort of play tournaments. Like they, they, they don't care if 10,000 people watch or 100,000 people. I'm not sure it matters that much, un yeah, unless I'm wrong. It's, it's an interesting question, but I don't uh, blame the players as such because the entire uh, ecosystem mm -hmm. is such that they are not required to push themselves to do it. But imagine today a huge sponsor comes up and you know uh, says that you know after the games, uh, please make sure that you do do uh, the interviews and all. I think they would do it. The only thing is chess is so personal uh, on a mental level that it is very difficult to snap out of the game and just be like uh, let's say a cricketer after a match or a footballer or a tennis player. Somehow uh, you just are so engrossed into it. 
so i do i do agree with you at some level that chess players should be more forthcoming with their thoughts in order to attract the audience but i think it is not their job entirely to to do that uh, maybe if the ecosystem changes if there are better uh, you know interviewers if the if the sponsors have things in place maybe that can help in a much better way that yeah that's very fair uh, i i i it's is it the only game on earth that is now so popular but is entirely mental and not physical it's a it's a great point yeah we like to draw comparisons but at some point you have to stop and think all the other things that we're describing are sports uh, even tennis which is not a combat sport and is one of the most professional sports in the world. I would say like tennis and chess, like very, everybody's high esteem. You don't need to talk any trash. You go out, you compete, and you give kind of the same cycle of questions in your interviews. How much have you prepared and all this stuff, right? So, but- You know, you know the thing is, uh, I find it interesting when I sometimes read that, you know, all the time I'm talking about, you know, how to popularize chess, how to make it more exciting. And I'm sure you also have those questions on your head when you in your mind when you're making video and then suddenly i read somewhere and someone writes what's the need to popularize chess what's the need to make it like a top sport or something you know it's a it's a sport mm-hmm. people play it they have their own following and you know why do you want to change the format and like i know that these questions don't make sense because at the end of it you have sponsors coming in because more people follow it and then you get more uh, things happening because of that and so on but just this question sometimes it strikes me and i'm like yeah maybe you know if chess naturally if you portray it like let's say a classical game and people are not following it do you need to go like completely out of your way and make it like into a spectator sport uh, I- i'm not sure that's and the probably the best modern example of that would be the push for rapid and blitz and the mm. online stuff uh i mean singfield cup is a good example when this launches the video will be out but that was one of the only tournaments so far this year i have done i, I didn't do round by round recaps. recaps because i i got tired of it it was just really saturating my that's nine to 15 days depending on how long the tournament is where i can be uploading a video that's instructive chess tips opening mistakes traps whatever you know elo wrote like i have a sticky note right here on my desktop of all my next videos i want to make and (laughs) and i like to upload two a day if i'm fresh but when there's the 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 recaps are there i get lazy i just make one recap and i'm like okay i'll come back tomorrow you know and i decided not to make any recaps and i was looking at, at how many people were writing me messages saying i don't follow tournaments if it's not for your recaps yeah. And especially classical. I mean, the live broadcast for some of these classical events is so low, but the tour online rapid combined over a hundred thousand viewers everywhere. So it it is interesting because classical chess is the highest level of the game. Yeah. And it might not be a I don't know, it, it might not be the case anymore I mean, i'm saying not not in terms of the level but in terms of the angling it toward participants i but do you really think we're going to see crazy change like to the world championship for example i i i doubt because the thing is that there are i mean of course magnus himself speaks about shorter format um, mm-hmm. becoming more important and so on so uh, and fide has to come together and all of those are at that change but Talking at uh, what I understand, I still feel that classical chess has its adherence. Uh, for example, when the World Cup was going on yeah. uh, and when Vidit was playing and on Chess Base India, when I was doing the commentary and his, uh, you know, match against Duda, uh, it was the only match that I was covering, you know, and like imagine that it's a five hour broadcast and it's just Vidit's game, like not even like you're covering all the quarterfinal mm-hmm. games. Uh, and there were close to 20,000 plus people watching it. So I, I do think that uh, it's more like the, the new audience which has come into the sport is attached to personalities, is attached to stories. Uh, and I think, yes, chess, they like chess at some level, but they also like 
let's say Rishi Anand, they like yeah. Vidit, they like Nakamura, they like um, Aronian, they like Anishkiri. And so I think at the end of the day, uh, it's these personalities which will also drive uh, the crowd, I think. When did you get close to Vidit? Was it during pandemic or were you close even before? No, I think I, uh, since he was a young boy, uh, oh, we okay. traveled together to tournaments. Uh, and in fact, I've played with him six times uh, when he was young. And what's what's six, the score? Six draws, yeah, six draws. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. But really? I, he, yeah, yeah, he was 2300. I was also roughly that level. And then he started moving upwards and then we couldn't play anymore. Um, but I, I do remember a story where I think we were traveling back from an event and mm -hmm. um, I said, okay, to... Uh, we were around the same level rating wise, I think. I said, let's play blitz in a, in a train, you know, in Indian trains, there are these different berths. So we sat on the top berth of the train and started playing. And he beat me uh, once, then we played another game, then he beat me again. And we played, I think, 15 games. And every time he beat me, and I think this happens with very few people that you can't even get a draw or mm -hmm. something. And then that's when you realize that 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 player is special, you know, uh, <laughs> that you are not special. But although that you know that that I was not special, but at least I could hold him for a game, yeah. beat him once in 15 games. Well, I think that, that these are the kind of players, and I see that in all the young talents these days, like those who are young, they yeah. are not like, oh, I have won 10 games and I, I need to now, it's okay if he wins one or something. They are like, oh, this game, what's the tactic here? Oh, I need to make this best move. And these players are the most scary, yeah? like who are into chess completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the misfortune of playing a really underrated, talented kid from, from India. Do you know this story or, or no? no? I talked about him a little bit. So I, was, I went to, the, to Europe because it's, you know, Europe is a little notorious for having tournaments and players maybe not as strong as other places. There's always this reputation. Uh, but in, on a serious note, two years ago, I made a trip to Europe uh, to play in Pardubica in Czech Open with my friend. And then uh, like two and a half weeks later to Riga Technical Institute. And we were going to travel Western Europe. So we were going to go to Amsterdam, Brussels, like beautiful trip we planned. I planned everything. Like, it was like taking my child, basically. I love my friend, but I planned the whole trip. And in Pardubica, round six, I got a stomach infection, and I had to go back to the United States. I was so sick, I lost 15 pounds. 15 pounds on this trip. My God. But in that tournament, I played Rahil Mulik, who... Oh. And I played him one month after he gained about 100 points. So a month ago, he was like 2,000 playing these tournaments in Italy, Serbia. I'm looking at this guy. And in the first round, I played somebody named um, uh, Dev Shah. I don't know if, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what his rating is now, but like. Yeah, he should be around 2300. Yeah, right exactly. Now. I played Dev Shah and like I, I, I won, but it was not easy. And so I played Rahil and I was like, man, he has the same repertoire. They have a very similar repertoire. I'm looking like what to do. And I go into a little bit of a suspicious, but very like aggressive variation and he kills me. Like, it's not close. Every time I thought I was getting an initiative, he saw one move more than me. And the whole game, he was making moves, and I'm like, what is he doing? And he played the best moves. Every game, like the, every move was like the best move according to the computer, tactics, everything. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, oh my God. And now this kid is like 24.50 IM. Like maybe even more, he might even yeah. be. My, actually, my wife uh, would be very happy and my brother-in-law uh, listening to this because Rahil spent like so many hours at our place when he was a young kid. He was my wife's student. And now wow. my uh, wife's brother, so my brother-in-law, uh, teaches his uh, Prathamesh Mukal, teaches him. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's funny that out of all the talents, you <laughs> spoke about Rahil, you know? <laughs> That's so that's crazy. Yeah. And then I saw him like a month later, I saw him beat some 2600 in Dubai or, or, or Sharjah. Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Two, yeah Abu Dhabi. 2600 back yep. to back. And I'm like, yeah, that kid beat me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here like, woo. I was mad though. He took so much rating from me. You know, and I wasn't mad at him. I was just mad at life. Like, how, how could I get paired against this, this guy? Because I got to 2430 IM. 
I, I be, what I, the way I became an IM is I, so I, I was a late bloomer. I quit chess between 12 and 15, rated 2000. Then I came back and I slowly crawled to 2200 American. 2300 I got to like, by the time I was 18, 19 years old. 2300 American. And then I started playing FIDE tournaments. And 2016, I almost became an IM. I had two norms and 2400, but I missed it by half a point. Uh, I almost didn't play in 2017. Life got in the way. And then in 2018, I scheduled like six tournaments for the summer. I'm going to become an IM. And I became an IM in the first tournament. Oh. And, and, and then you lost motivation? Or yes. You? <laughs> literally, I lost 85 rating points in the rest oh of the God. tournaments. And I never thought, I, like, I, I was kind of stunned. I, I, it, it was crazy. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I was going to these games and I didn't care. I only cared once I lost. But I couldn't bring myself to study. I couldn't bring myself. And once I started slipping, I didn't really know how to stop. I was really good at going red hot. Like I would crush these tournaments. And I wonder if you experience the same. You have two GM norms though. So you, you're yeah. like very professional, 2470. My peak rating is like 2430. And that game, I, uh, unofficially, officially it's 2421. That game I played the most beautiful game of my life. With black, I got a win against Emilio Cordova. I think that game is on my YouTube channel. Unofficially, 24, 29, four points out of five in World Open. I'm like, woo! And then from that point forward, like 90 points. And uh, I... You're, you're trying now. now, now I'm, you're trying, trying I'm trying. Now. <laughs> I, I listen. I got 10 of them back. I got 10 of them back. I'm playing a round robin tournament where I'm the lowest rated by 70 points. I'm a little scared, but I, I believe I have GM talent. I do not have GM nerves, and I do not have GM... Well, right now, it's not even about work ethic. It's, like, about time. I don't have a whole lot of time anymore, but... Uh, oh, if you can beat uh, with it with E4, C5, E3, then you, <laughs> you can become a GM. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, like, in general, I, I saw your games when we were going to play each other, and, and I saw that uh, the tactical ability is, is really great, and the ability to put uh, traps and to put the opponent under pressure because your pieces do create these uh, things very quickly and this is uh, really cool so I'm, I'm sure there's something missing because that element is so strong that uh, it, it should be uh, for a strong gm uh, that that strength but uh, there could be something missing if you fix that i guess you'll become a gm what what was it for you? Because when, I, first of all, I know you have a video on Chess Base India called Why I Did Not Become a GM or something like this. I, I was actually- What oh, stopped me from yeah. becoming a GM? Yeah, what's, so I, 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 for my audience, uh, and, and I, I don't know the ins and outs of your career, I know that in 2014, you became an IM and you were 2470. So that was your highest rating. So yeah. I'm, I wanna know your story. That, that's my story. I total adrenaline dump and decided, you know what, screw this. I'm not going to try to become a GM. And well, here we are. <laughs> Three years later. Yeah. I mean, I was uh, just a normal player, like, you know, who was around 20, 2300 when he was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to imagine that chess would become my career. Uh, also, I had finished chartered accountancy, which is uh, like, you know, one of, uh, one of the toughest examinations in India. So if you become a CA, you you can get good jobs and my father was also a ca who had his own work so so the idea was that okay chess yes you tried well you tried hard but now okay you've become a ca and let's get to work and i was pretty good at uh, it i i cleared it in the first attempt so everyone thought okay this is the natural shift and he'll continue playing chess just like that. But the day when I became a CA, I said I was in uh, Goa, uh, which is a very nice place. Like just what you see here. Yeah, it, it was exactly like this. And I was sitting on the beach and I said, uh, you know, I need to put in that effort into chess, which I have not ever put in. So how about uh, I asked, like, you know, I spoke with my parents and I said, can I just play for another year or so without having to worry about anything else mm -hmm. uh, like no studies nothing to do uh, and they said uh, okay fine you know you cleared ca in first attempt usually people take two years to do it uh, <laughs> so you 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 know you can uh, nice go and, and uh, play so i started playing and i started improving and i started to you know uh, do well i reached closer to 2400 
uh, at that point. So I was 23, 98 and I was playing a game. And if I, uh, if I drew or won that, I was winning against uh, Adli Ahmed. Uh, and uh, I made a move. I pressed the clock and it didn't get pressed. And I lost on time that game. Like it went down to zero. And oh my God. I, I got to 23, 93. Then I went down, 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 down. And I went to 2, 3, 0, 3 at that oh. point. And uh, the thing was that when I was about to get married to Amruta, my idea was that I will become a G, uh, an IM and then, you know, it would be nice to get married. But there I was uh, <laughs> getting married in 2014 to her with no uh, title, not knowing what to do with my, uh, you know, there was no income basically for me. And I still uh, married her, but the, but the moment I married Amruta, things changed yeah, in my life because she brought a kind of focus in my life, which I never witnessed ever before. She said, one of the things which she said was, if you ever leave chess, I'll leave you. You know, oh. so, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. so, so it was clear to me that I can never, ever go back to doing something related to accountancy and stuff like that. And uh, so the main thing is that when we got married, we planned trips to Europe for like, if we got a visa for 90 days, mm -hmm. we would plan it for 89 days, you know, like make the full use of it, uh, play in multiple events. And so the first trip we made over there in 2014, I achieved my IM title. I got a GM norm. Uh, I became an IM next year. I made my second norm. So the main thing was that with her, it was always like, you know, she believed in me. She felt like I can become like a grandmaster. I could become a great player. And so I never felt this lack of motivation because after the game, we would discuss and she would be like, oh, why didn't you do this? I think she played a huge role in my life to keep me like not distracted from things, which I was in general. That's beautiful. That in all of the episodes of this podcast might be the most beautiful moment so far because I feel the same way uh, about Lucy. Uh, not yet for the pursuit of the title, but in terms <laughs> of everything else. Uh, and I always say that I I would not I would not be me. Like there would be no Gotham if it wasn't for Lucy. So uh, have you have you shared the story of meeting her or uh, with your with your uh, with, viewers uh, before? Not not. Not on YouTube, no. I mean, maybe in like small parts, but never like a. But, but how did that happen? Oh, it's a wonderful story. Um, it uh, it 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 begins in November or October two thousand fifteen. Mm -hmm. um, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> this is the full story. So I've, I, I I'm trying to think what I want to cut out of it, but I'm I think I'm, I don't I don't think there's anything that bad. Um, I, you know, those like dating apps, right? Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 um, I went on, uh, a few dates with, uh, a person, uh, not named Lucy, not, not Lucy, but in NYU, they had a suite. They had like four people, two rooms. So two people per room, maybe the same in some colleges in India, maybe not, I don't know, but Lucy was the neighbor. So the first time I saw Lucy, I was like, I'm going this way. I'm visiting, visiting over here. And th that ended, whatever. A few months later, uh, I, I saw Lucy. We, you know, we're all, all these, you know, we're, we're young, we're on, this is how, this is how it works, at least in, in New York City. Um, very few people meet the old fashioned way, uh, sadly. Uh, but uh, I saw Lucy and I said, oh. And so we went on a date. She agreed to, to, to meet me for a date in 2015. And it was, it was fall. And we had a we had a good date. It I, well, here's the thing. I thought it was a good date. I thought it went great. I thought we laughed. I thought we had a good time. She hated me. <laughs> she completely hate. Like she thought I was the worst. But she kind of was curious. You know, this guy is like very. So here's the thing. I lived in Brooklyn, and she she went to school in Manhattan. I commuted to Manhattan to to have this date. And I said, okay, for the second date, you come to Brooklyn. No problem. Like let's let, let let's do this. And she didn't come. And she said no. And 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 then she made up some reason. She she was too afraid to take the train because you know you, she she's not from U.S. So she came here. She's like I don't want to take the train to Brooklyn. And I said, okay, look, I'm not gonna lie. I think it's kind of like I I can't. I, don't, I feel kind of weird dating somebody who can't get on a train. Like and, and so we argued a little bit and. I'm like I'm not gonna commute. Only we argued and that was that. <laughs> we never saw each other again. Uh, fast forward. 
two years, 2017, still once again, uh, my, you know, swiping around on these apps, I see Lucy. I send her a message, like a text. I don't go to like swipe on her and I send her a text because I still have her number. I'm like, hey, hey, like, how you been? We make a plan to meet mm. like in 2017 and she ghosts me. She yeah. doesn't, she, yeah, she agrees and then and never hear from her again. Like, all right, okay, fine. Fast forward once again, and um, it's, uh, it's I, I, I guess it's January 2019, mm. um, and I think, oh my goodness, yeah, it's January 2019, I see her once again on the app, and I text her again, and I say, hey, and this is the smoothest line of my life said, hey, do you think after three years I can get that second date? <laughs> and she, we start talking, and she agrees to meet me. And what I didn't know is she had to be convinced to go to that date. Like, she was going to cancel. And I texted her that same day, and I said, like, six hours before, hey, don't cancel this time. So she said, damn it, I can't cancel now. So we went to the date. And on purpose, I took us to a restaurant, Ethiopian restaurant. You know, Ethiopian food, you eat with your hands. You don't use utensils. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it to be a very like messy, you know, we wouldn't be like super calm and covering the mouth when we like chew, like all this stuff you have to do on dates. I said, nah, let's just, so the food was terrible. It just wasn't good food. It was very, it did not taste good, but the date was good. And we, we ended up, we ended up dating since then. It was good. Uh, in your head again, or no, 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 in, in uh, both. In both. <laughs> she, she, yeah, I, I think I think I also asked that. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm a completely different person than I was in early 2019. There were both of us. We 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 had it rough. There there were a lot of ups and downs to make it to where we are now. But now we are happy, healthy, and I could not imagine being with anybody else. And um, yeah, but it, it it took work. And I I don't uh, I don't know if you can echo that or if you find that Amruta is like a soulmate and you've never argued, but it, it takes work. I mean, it takes work. It took work for us. And yeah, <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, I do not relate to the work that you put in uh, for this, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I see where you can now, I mean, becoming a GM would be much easier than, you know, what getting you a, a second date with Lucy. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think for me, it was, uh, very uh, like she uh, liked me i was just 18 years old at that point uh, and uh, she she proposed me I, directly she said will you be my boyfriend and i i thought it was too soon but she was like she had this thing yeah she always has this clarity that okay if you're going to say yes to me uh, then we will continue and i'll get myself more invested in you mm -hmm. but if you say no then okay i should have the ability to move on and basically her experiences were that you know once you get really deep into it it becomes very difficult so that's the reason why she asked me at this moment and i was too young and uh, naive and i didn't understand anything i said okay sure <laughs> and <laughs> at at that point like for the next uh, few years i was always very worried about what was happening? Does it affect my chest? Uh, will I, will I, you know, drop in rating? Um, you know, she's elder to me and all these things, you know, and also the, the society that I grew up in was mm -hmm. such that uh, in some ways you don't openly talk about your relationships and stuff like that. And uh, it was not a very easy period for me. And if I could go back and turn things around, I would have much more fun back then. Like whenever I played in the tournaments and I used to feel guilty that, you know, is it because of lack of effort that I'm putting in on the chessboard and spending more time with her or something like that, that I'm getting the, into this. But um, yeah, I, I realized that my mind was filled with all these uh, unnecessary things. And I, I grew. Uh, and now I, I realized that She's the best thing to have happened to my life. Uh, I mean, there are so many things that, uh, that I can talk about, but yeah, it's it's the best right now. I feel like no subject is, well, I, I can hear like popping noises outside and I'm just sort of hoping it's fireworks and not gunshots. Um, so that's, that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good uh, transition of subject. Um, 
No, I, yeah, like this whole, for me, it's, it's not necessarily about the competitive pursuit, uh, uh, but it is, um, it is the, the, the career and everything. And, um, I mean, making plans of all th things like potentially owning an animal, uh, kids travel, where we're going to live in the world, anywhere between the next two and 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that's all stuff. And I, I would never... I would not want to do that with anybody else. And uh, yeah. so, no, like I said, I, 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 don't, I don't know how on earth we are going to talk about anything that is going to be as nice and as wholesome uh, as we are now. <laughs> but, uh, well, you, you're right there. You, well, in the in norm category of things, but in the, in the rating you've decided, like, and, and you, I think you're 2410 maybe, like I, I yeah. remember. Like, 2407, I think. So, do you have that fire? Do you, do, you, do you want, like, a good push? A good summer, you could do it. Because one norm is 30 points, you know? And then after that, it's just... Yeah, I, I think uh, overall chess for me was like a flowing thing in my life at mm -hmm. that point where I was going to tournaments, preparing, improving, training, doing all of that. And right now, Chess Base India and working as an entrepreneur and as a, as a chess promoter is the flow. So in order to get back into that flow, you have to cut this flow. Like, uh, and uh, this is something which is not easy. I mean, and also I keep questioning myself, like, uh, what's the need to become a grandmaster? Like, what is it? So, okay, the only thing that comes to my mind at that point is that it's a personal challenge. Mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of sense to me that if it's a personal challenge, then yes, I can take it up. But the thing is, there are so many challenges right now, like in, in, in Indian chess itself, like for example, or, or in the chess world, that you need to uh, give more opportunities to youngsters. You need to uh, get better events happening. You need to make sure that they have better sponsors, uh, better. And I think this is where the opportunity lies. And this is where... Uh, I am uh, strategically positioned that I can make the biggest difference. So if I become a GM and invest two years of my life into it, rather than that, I could work and maybe create another uh, batch of new, strong talents in Indian chess. And I, I think it, it makes more sense, no? It totally makes more sense. I, I, I'm just, I'm playing devil's advocate because I have to deal with these questions. I'm sure you do, you do it as well. It's, you see an IM, you see a GM. Um, and what folks also have to realize is, like, uh, this whole chess boom has given us a lot closer access to people like Anish, to Hikaru. Well, Magnus, he doesn't stream that much, but the other day he was playing Bullet on his phone in a hot tub. So I think it's kind of unparalleled access, you know? Uh, but all these guys are the best grandmasters in the world, and arguably ever. I mean, today's Super GM is much better than the Super GM of 10 years ago. So, and, and that's chess is going to continue to be that way. It's like that in, in most sports, really, because of all the developments. And, um, and what I think people don't realize is, at least for me, if I become GM, I'm done. I am not trying to gain any more rating. One letter changes in my title. I have an official rating of 2,500. I will never play classical chess again. <laughs> that, so it's kind of weird because it, it, I'm going to do all this effort to change a letter. So when people ask me how far I am from GM, I just say one letter because it's easier than saying three norms and 147 rating points. So I, I don't, you know, back in the day when I was teaching, if I became GM, I could charge more for private lessons. Mm. Uh, I could uh, stuff like that, but I can say, oh, I'm GM, yeah. but it changes yes, nothing even now. now. I mean, if you're making videos and you think about it that, okay, you are GM, Levy, Rojman, not I am. Uh, logically, it should make sense that, oh, people listen to a grandmaster more than an international master. But I think once people get connected to you, the way you speak, the way you teach, the way you uh, do things, I guess for them also, it doesn't really matter if you become a GM in terms of, you know, of course, for your personal story, yes, they would be very happy for you becoming a GM, but for the value of the learning that they get from you or your coverage, I don't think it's going to change. Yeah, that's fair. 
But speaking of people who are going to be GM and are GM and going to be super talented, uh, these young players in India, uh, obviously, you, we, we've mentioned, I, I mentioned playing against uh, Rahil. I've also played, uh, I have a very good score against Nihal Saran because I haven't played him in like two years. <laughs> so it's something r borderline respectable. I also have the same versus Firuja. I had like nine wins, 11 losses, but all of them were in 30 second chess. Uh, I remember I would play Nihal back when we were kind of close. How... Talk a little bit about them, because you, 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 you don't work with them directly as students, do you? Or, or do you not? What exactly is the relationship? Because you, you talked a little bit earlier about, like, Rahil, and you had a direct impact there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I you... mean, that was just one exception. Oh, but coincidence, okay. That, yeah, it was a coincidence. I mean, Amruta had only one student who was very serious about chess. And, and it was him? That was Rahil. That's yes. crazy, wow. And... Uh, but uh, apart from that, like what happened is that when Chess Base India began in 2016, early 2016, is when, uh, and I, we were reporting back in 2015 as well, is when these youngsters started rising, you know, like, so uh, if you see the first reports on Chess Base India, they are like Nihal Sarin or Pragnananda 2000 or 2100. Mm -hmm. Gukesh was 1700. Uh, he was playing in a tournament and then his father would, you know, go for, they would go for uh, food together and I would take a picture and they were discussing uh, games. So the thing was the rise of uh, Chess Base India also kind of coincided with the rise of these talents. And so every little uh, milestone that they, that they covered, like let's say making their first norm, I am norm, second I am norm, I was like, you know, on top of it, trying to cover it. Even now when Gukesh crossed 2600 yesterday, it felt like, you know, I have, I mean, I have to cover everything that is happening in their life. You can get it done. So in a way that has been my uh, connection with them, like being on their journey, covering every bit by bit of it. Uh, but uh, apart from that, like recently there was this camp that was held by Microsense. Uh, it's a company in India where uh, it's into uh, it's all in, in, into wireless uh, internet, mm -hmm. and they are also sponsoring the Olympiad Olymp team Olympiad. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. time. Yeah, and uh, they invited Kramnik uh, and Gelfand to India. We we also went to uh, uh, France, uh, where we uh, lived in a villa. Six talents. Uh, me and Amruta and Kramnik used to come from his home to teach these kids there. Uh, and so that is where I kind of uh, got in touch with them day to day basis, like wake them up, give them food and, you know, uh, tell them let's go to sleep and stuff like that. And I, I just realized that these kids, there's no stopping them for one simple reason is because there's nothing in the world that they would do more than playing chess and talking about chess. You know, like there's this, you can't tell them, oh, oh, that's more interesting there. Let's go and uh, play football or let's watch some cricket or something. It's like chess is what they love. So how do you stop these kids? And they have talent. Yeah, like it's not like they just, uh, they just love it. They are, they're very good at it. So it's a deadly combo. I mean, it's unless something goes really wrong in their head, they don't get right backing, they don't get the right coach, or they don't, mm -hmm. uh, and they start feeling a little bit insecure about things and stuff like that. Uh, if everything else is taken care of, they will keep improving. And you were there with them in France uh, in the role of the, like the correspondent, or you also helped organize the whole camp with, with Microsense? What, what was... Yeah, so I mean, the thing was, so this is what I say, yeah, like Chess Base India is uh, kind of critical in that sense, because let's say Microsense is a, is a company which loves chess, uh, mm -hmm. the, the founder loves chess, and he wants to invest in the sport. But at the end of the day, there are a lot of little things that have to be taken care of, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, corresponding with Kramnik, finding a house, staying there, traveling, taking care of the kids. I mean, if all the parents had to travel, that would have, you know, increased the cost multiple times. And so Amruta and I decided that, okay, we'll be in the role of managing the event, uh, of uh, making sure that, uh, you know, the, the kids are taken care of. And also on day-to-day -day basis to write about it mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, videos and that comes very naturally when you are there. So um, that's how it was. And 
Amruta used to cook food for them every day and uh, some of them liked it, some of them disliked it. So, I mean, we became friends, basically, all of, all of us. I don't know if this is too direct of a question, um, or I, I, but I am curious about, uh, and we, by the way, we, we can always cut anything out because uh, we, we, we're currently recording this. But if not, then hi, audience, then we didn't edit this part out. Um, what I was going to ask is, like, that all sounds, inc- like, your role in this sounds incredible. Uh, and you are instrumental to the development of India for, uh, for potentially decades because if these kids are playing chess growing up and now they're going to be super famous because of their talent, they might end up competing for the world championship and you played a role in all of that, right? You played a role in developing all of that, which I, I think is in, incredible and extremely honorable. But Sagar, what I'm worried about is how are you making a career? Where in this pipeline are you getting paid? Because the kids, like aren't paying you, right? And like, so how does Chess Base India, is it through the sponsorship deals or do you just not worry about that and you make, Chess Base India makes money in a different way? Because I'm, I'm worried about you here. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, firstly, just to add here, like these kids, I feel uh, so many people have put uh, things behind them, their trainers, their parents and all. So, I mean, I, I cannot claim credit for uh, them reaching there. I would be very happy that uh, when they do it, but they are, you know, the the back backbones of each of these players mm-hmm. is tremendously strong. And when it comes to parents, they are so focused. I think that is one of the critical aspects of each kid. Like the parental support is tremendous. Uh, coming to the question of, you know, like uh, getting paid, I think, the the ba- the biggest advantage we had when we began chessbase india was mm-hmm. that chessbase believed in what we were proposing which was like give us the products uh, at a cost where people can afford it you know like where we can sell it and so uh, they were breaking their market yeah like they said okay in india you can sell it and um, they could have been afraid that people would not stop buying from outside India, I mean, outsiders would come and buy it from India. But I mean, ethics is something that is very strongly imbibed in both Amruta, me and uh, that we brought into Chess Base India as well. And what happened was that from day one, we did not need an investor. There was a constant flow, although it was very little, Mm -hmm. but we didn't have expenses. And the idea was that at the end of the day, we will not... uh, this is not our career. Yeah. Chess based India. We want to be chess players. Maybe we'll make an academy. We'll teach and so on. So we were never pressured into uh, making money out of it. Uh, and, but slowly and steadily, I realized that, okay, that one thing is there, then we can uh, create content. And from there it's possible to earn something. Uh, but I, I will tell you that it was very tough to make a living out of this uh, because Let's say if you go to a tournament and you cover the event, um, people don't know. I mean, should they pay you? I'm like, <laughs> why, why should? Why? Yeah, I'm yeah. going there. I'm I'm writing reports every day. I'm shooting. I'm interviewing the sponsors. I'm putting up their logo on my channel. Uh, so they would sometimes sponsor our flights. They would give us to stay, but to get paid was not easy. And so I think that in a way. Um, if we were doing it for money, we would have stopped it long back, you know, uh, this thing, because there was not enough. And basically, if you teach uh, in chess, there's a ready-made like a rate card. Yeah, like this is, if your level is this, you can charge this. People are ready to pay for it. Especially, uh, I I taught pretty, pretty decently, so I could earn that. But my idea always was to do it on a big scale. So whoever I was teaching, uh, I stopped it. Amruta stopped her training and to make it bigger through YouTube to reach out to more people. And I'm glad that it is going in the right direction right now. And I think slowly and steadily, the money keeps flowing in from different ways uh, as things become more popular, uh, as more people view our videos and stuff like that, that becomes much better. So at the end of the day, I if, if there's enough, for paying our employees, for paying ourselves, then we don't need more. And I think that's what we did with our YouTube memberships as well. Each and every uh, money that we get, 
a membership is given to one talent every month uh, and so the the role is very clear in my head that i need to support indian youngsters indian chess and there's nothing more important than that if i can make more money out of let's say the youtube channel or my coverage i have to reinvest it back into chess so that there could be there could be more talents who will benefit out of it i i also hope you understand when i when i ask a question like that and i hope whoever listens to this in the future understands uh i was asking it from the standpoint of there are a lot of people in this world who get paid far too much <laughs> far too much uh, like some of the billionaires, and uh, and if you ever look at a growth chart of the income of people, it's like everyone's down here. Even the millionaires are down here, but you know you got the richest people in the world up over here, and it's just this crazy gap. Although people who are listening just the audio don't see me doing what I'm doing with my hands. Uh, you are the complete reverse. Like you're doing so much, and it, the reason why I asked that question is. I wanted to know whether you were being fairly compensated for the work that yeah. you did and also no, being a, so that's. It's, I think it's the principles uh, that match for both of Amruta and me, that money is not the most important thing for us. Yeah. And that's the reason why uh, at the end of the day, let's say if it's about books, yeah, like we get the books to India. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, I mean, quality chess has helped us tremendously there, Jakob Agard and so on. They, they ship the books here and this, we sell it at 1099 rupees. Uh, we pay half the amount as the cost and then we have courier service. We have to pay the rent of the... So actually the margin that we make on every sale is, is quite low. Uh, and, and to sustain a business with the effort that it takes, like India is huge yeah, as a country. And when we have to ship it to Northeast, that place, uh, it takes days and we have to call up and did you get the book? But I think about it that way, that a young kid who's going to open this book in, in that region and is going to read it will experience a boost in his chest strength, which was not available before to him. And I think uh, anything that powers chess is worth doing for us, uh, even if at the end of the day, uh, we cannot, I mean, it, we shouldn't be making a loss. Yeah. Like we shouldn't be, I mean, that yeah. keen uh, sense of business does exist in me. I cannot, uh, at the end of the day, I know that I should have a strong uh, financial foundation to keep this going, to keep this rolling, but uh, it need not make, uh, like I was reading this book. Uh, I don't know if you have read it called four hour work week. Have you, have you seen that book? It's mm, by Tim no. Ferriss. And uh, he talks about how you can automate your income uh, in general and how you can work for only four hours every week. I mean, the title is a little bit catchy <laughs> and still make a lot of money out of it. Yeah. And I realized that what he's talking about is doing things to put things in place on one end. And then pursuing some kind of a passion, you know, like, oh, go and do salsa in some country and do kickboxing and stuff like that, while you have an automated income flowing from one end. Uh, for, for me, it's like, uh, I enjoy doing this. Why, why do I need to automate income from somewhere else, you know? Yeah, that, that, that is true. I mean, the more you scale, then you, well, I, I have the kind of this problem right now, it's, I, I really like doing all the YouTube and I, and I like doing a lot of things that I can do myself. I cannot design thumbnails. I cannot do Photoshop, but <laughs> I, I conceptualize probably three quarters of my thumbnails. I, I say, I say to my guy, yeah. this is yeah. what I'm thinking. And then he does it. It's incredible. But I envy the people that have a team around them. Now, granted, you would lose a little bit financially there because you have to pay those people, but <laughs> The people at the very top who make it through and then just hire the people to work b a little bit below them or not, not quite next to them, but to, to put all that stuff in place. Yeah, it's, it's scaling. Yeah, but you, you, will, you will reach there, I guess. You uh, will have I don't want to. Well, at least, at least not for YouTube. If I, if I do some other projects, then, well, yeah, sure. But I, I do frequently feel... You ever feel like there's not enough hours in the day or do you go to bed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. you feel that way? Yeah. No, I, I feel it uh, all the time. Uh, also, I mean, I do go through the low parts, like, although I enjoy doing whatever I'm doing uh, right now, I do feel sometimes that 
it has become monotonous especially in the last one and a half years when i'm not able to travel anywhere it's become very tough on me especially in the last few days when i'm not able to uh, you know go out uh, meet you know we were traveling like half the year mm-hmm. to tournaments me and now suddenly for one and a half years we are in home in fact we did this crazy one year trip where we uh, put all our belongings into a warehouse and we left the house me and my wife amruta and we traveled to 45 different indian cities uh, one after the other and we covered one tournament something else just to get a sense of how indian chess is what's happening and it was crazy i mean uh, and then you are you are stuck in a house uh, for this time so it's not easy and i think uh, streaming did help but yeah a little bit of change is needed you said when did you do the trip it was in 2018 uh 2017 end uh, so we were coming back from the world cup and i told amruta that let's do this and she was like okay come on this is a crazy idea we can't do it we have a house and you know we we were on rent but i said it's nothing yeah like we just found this company which takes away all your stuff puts it in a 6 by 6 box yeah and puts stores it in a warehouse and you you go out and you have two bags with you and you travel for so what was happening is every time we went to a tournament we had to come back home and i said to amruta let's do this yeah like we don't come back home if we don't get any tournaments to go to we'll book a hotel and we'll stay in a hotel we are anyway paying rent here we will save on that and we'll do this and we did it and we didn't know what will happen we did one event to the next to something else to to covering something uh, to going to academy to 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 basically on the grassroots level understanding what indian chess is and then in may there was 6 months into it uh, i realized what we were missing out yeah like the main thing was there was no stability no food uh, you know you have no uh, guarantee where your how your next food would be what whether you will exercise or not and it started like amruta started getting these anxiety attacks at night uh, overworking ourselves and we went to the hospital uh, one fine day in, uh, and the doctor said uh, do you guys uh, take a break do you overwork yourself and we were like yes he said stop it or else it's going to go uh, down the drain so the next day we booked a flight and we went to kerala uh again that is something which we could and kerala is known for its ayurvedic massages and stuff like that we lived in such a beach and kind of uh, but uh, it was uh, the learning of a lifetime yeah like we we learned so much in a year but a year you said six, six months or a year yeah i mean earlier we were traveling six months out of a year mm-hmm. like but this was one year of continuous travel without having a home basically living out of the suitcase so uh, what that is crazy <laughs> i what really oh my yes. gosh so i i mean i the closest equivalent to this is people backpacking europe you know this like term people yeah. get their backpack and then they 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 go to europe wow 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 um uh, did you ever You have any crazy stories from this trip? I mean, did you ever like not have a bed to sleep in? You ever have to like sleep outside somewhere? I mean, like this no, is I crazy. Mean, reached, I mean, generally, uh, you have things planned, right? Here when we reached Kerala once, uh, we mm. we reached places multiple times yeah in that year. Uh, we got out at the airport and we were like we don't know where to go now because we haven't booked anything. So we would pull out our phones and see what is the nearest uh, best place, but we yeah. always had something in mind. we wanted to go to the chess village you have you heard of this it's called maruti chal if you google if you put in google maps chess mm-hmm. uh, village it will bring up this place i've in heard Kerala. about it being developed yeah mm-hmm. and it was about like you know people were uh, alcohol addicts there and they had to you know bring in uh, like everyone was drinking and then one guy said okay let's play chess and then everyone uh, started playing chess and kind of chess one over alcohol it's a beautiful story so we were like oh this one year trip this is the place it's like our home yeah like if we are chess lovers we have to go to the chess village so we go there we take an auto rickshaw which is like this uh, vehicle on three uh, wheels and we go inside the forest and there we realize that uh, the the town of or you can say the village 
had uh, absolutely no chess like no one was playing i mean i was expecting people to be on the streets playing chess and uh, we said chess 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 and everyone was pointing towards this one house like go there uh, one shop and we went there and we found this man who had started it uh, we played chess at his house few more people came in but it was like an eye opener like you know when you see these documentaries on bbc and uh, everywhere they kind of shoot it in a way where you have something portrayed in your head which we wanted to go and witness and shoot it oh everyone playing chess but it was not to be yeah. like uh, it was they they like chess everyone loved chess there but it was not like everywhere spread around how uh, you find any talented players that you know to this day on this trip yeah i think uh, overall i mean we went to dif- different places and there were many talented youngsters whom we met and we would interview and so on uh, i think many of them have kept uh, moving along and you know become stronger but these uh, these batch of talents nihal pragnananda gukesh raunak leon um prithu oh, now, now you started naming names you have to name everybody <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no i mean uh, these are the indian Arjun uh, Arjun Arigesi uh, Arjun Kalyan uh, I mean these are few of the ones also there are a few very talented IMs uh, v uh, Pranav right Pranav I see always on chess.com Pranav v there's Pranav Anand there's Mitra Baguha there is I mean there are so many uh, talents uh, overall that it's I mean there's this you know the thing is in Indian chess there was this one point where every grandmaster would get employed somewhere like in some public sector companies they would give employment to them and they would get paid for it now i worry about this because the rate at which grandmasters are growing there might not be enough spots you know to get uh, employment uh, it's like is it tradition or is it the law that no it's like uh, there's sports quota always uh, mm. in these organizations and once you become a gm you kind of reach that threshold where you can get employed you don't have to work you will get paid and so every indian gm be it hari krishna vidit uh, ganguly everyone's employed with some or like ongc uh, oil and natural gas company or bpcl bharat petroleum and they get a salary uh, every month on in their account without having to do any work so right now let's say if we talk about vidit mm-hmm. uh, he gets a salary every month uh, from this which ensures that if he doesn't play well in tournaments if he doesn't get any other things to do he will make a living which is kind of okay it's not a huge amount but it's stable oh so large companies have to pay for um the month like some monthly sal- salary of you said of 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 sports yeah like i mean val- it's not large companies these are government companies so oh government uh, companies okay yeah. so i mean uh, public sector companies and uh-huh. basically uh, they they don't have to but uh, i mean they have these things in them to support indian sports yeah this is like it's called pspb which is petroleum sports promotion board they support variety of different sports in the country and it's one of the main reason i mean the main reason for chess boom in india is vishyanand uh, but yeah. if someone were to ask me what's the next reason i would say pspb just imagine that when you are starting out chess you know at the back of your head if you become a gm you will have this security of a job it's it's something huge yeah if is you... it just the petrol because you you mentioned there's, there's railways a... railways uh, oh. uh, and there is also postal department which employs a few there's income tax department which employs few people Did... so Did they do this themselves or did the government mandate it? Yeah, I mean it's from the government. Okay. Uh, and uh, the thing is that every few years they have a change in their setup uh, mm-hmm. as to how to do it. So right now I think they have reached the threshold where any new talent who comes in there's there's no space, yeah, like because mm. the the quota is filled up. So that's a bit worrying part, but I think with the boom of chess and with corporate sponsors coming in I think now the switch is happening like you know now it's not as stable as this one mm-hmm. but I think uh, people who are the corporations are finding it much more lucrative to sponsor chess players and so on 
Because one of the things I was going to ask you, and this is not meant to discourage anyone, but it's always in my mind, when, I, when I'm thinking of these young talents, it's like uh, bright stars. Yeah, they, they burn out fast. So uh, I'm not saying they, they but that's that literally uh, with, with stars, but I'm talking about chess players. Um, for these players who are just consistently growing and uh, are, are winning tournament after tournament, what is the, what is the end goal? Like, is the end goal to become 2700 and to become the world champion is a separate goal? What is the goal? And, and where, do you, where do you start looking for other opportunities? Because you, you can't break past that. that. That is always what I'm fascinated by. Uh, because we talked at the very beginning, if you're outside of that little bubble that Vidit is trying to consistently get into, like, 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 like Vidit wants to, he's in, but we want to see Vidit at every closed event. Right, yeah. so no, it's very tough, yeah, like, for so, him to get invited everywhere because there's already these top players in the world who get yeah. constantly invited. Yeah, like so, I, I'm I'm wondering. I mean, you know, if these guys like some of them, Nihal's almost twenty seven hundred, but what's like Nihal is gonna try to become the world champion, right? Like, or at least break into the candidates one yeah. step at a no, time. No, for but, sure. Yeah, I mean, so. each one of them is like, but the thing is that whenever you can watch their any interview yeah like these some of the young talents i, I wouldn't say everyone is like that but majority is like, like you ask them about them winning the tournament you ask them about the prize money you ask them about rating points it's like yeah i don't know how much money i want yeah maybe like five thousand dollars yeah, it's fine yeah. or, or rating points yeah i think i reached 26 something i don't remember you need to check uh what about this move in, oh, I need to tell you about this move in this position. You know, I found this idea, you know, I was told by, I played an online game. So you see the, the priority is just to keep improving at chess. And uh, I know it sounds idealistic, but they are doing it. And that's where I feel that it's uh, very difficult to stop them. I see. So it's not something consciously on their mind. And it's more the responsibility of everybody watching greatness and we don't really have a mat like i can't say chess media but it's for people like myself to start you know speculating if a player commits their entire life to chess at what point is it like okay well there's other opportunities and th the truth is having a state-sponsored uh, salary is fascinating because that would never happen in a million years in the united states we are far too capitalistic <laughs> we uh that's why I asked if it was government mandated because I would I, I don't know if companies would be able to just do that out of the goodness of their heart. Well, but there is also a government mandate now, which is called CSR for mm -hmm. uh, not for the public sector but for private sector companies. It's called corporate social responsibility, and there you have to put in a some amount into uh, doing some social responsibility. And I think uh, supporting sports does fit in there. And so, you know, there are, there are these opportunities where they will support chess and so on. So I, I, while it was really cool back in the day when everyone was getting a job and all, now is a new challenge. And I think with the new chess boom, um, that will be taken care of, I think. I hope so. Because it's, it's pretty bleak in the United States. Yeah, I, I know. I've spoken to, I mean, I recently interviewed Hans Niemann as well, uh, who was who's right now on the rise. I mean, one of the, he's on 2600. Mm -hmm. Before that, I mean, I've spoken to some in, in events uh, to some, and I know that education and chess kind of collide with each other and they have to constantly be worrying about it, right? Yes. So uh, a lot of players don't finish school. Uh, they get homeschooled. I, I, I don't even know if Hans finished high school. I think he might have finished grade 11 or grade 10. I know there was conversation of him going to college. Uh, but yeah, now he's on the rise at 2,600. Like for, for, even for a guy like him, I mean, if, you, if you're not high enough rated in a country like the United States, which seems to be constantly importing players at this point, uh, you're not even going to make it to the U.S. championship. And even if you do... And uh, I don't mean any disrespect to like, you know, Darius Schwierz, who's a very strong player, but he just had a very difficult US uh, or Singfield Cup, 
he just played. Mm-hmm. And, Sh- and Schwierz is 2640, one of the strongest players in the world, maybe top 100. But there's just a level. There's a, another, another level beyond that. And then even beyond 2740, 2730, there's, another, there's, a, there's a Caruana level, yeah. a Dingley yeah. Run level. Yeah. So uh, I do not have any experience being a 2680, 2640 GM, but uh, it seems like the career opportunities are very limited in a country like the United States. Because if you're not mm-hmm. getting invited to these tournaments, you need to make a course or... Yeah. A couple of courses. Someone needs to commission you to make a course. Beyond that, man, I don't know. I mean, yeah. they don't want you to go to a speaker event unless you're the champion. They don't talk to the person who's good but not a champion. You know, they're not going to invite. They're going to invite a Hikaru, a Magnus, Anish, Vidit to speak somewhere. But so, um, and I'm. I saw Vidit had Black Lotus. Like they, I saw that everywhere. Um, and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean that that's why I mentioned about India. It's like it's like its own ecosystem. It's it 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 seems like some things are figured out there better than other places. The United States is pretty large, but man, we have not we have not figured out how to support chess. Um, yeah, it's I mean in general it's still a problem here. I might be talking about few of the young talents who are uh, you know well supported. There are so many other grandmasters who might be struggling uh, right now to make a living and they have to had to turn to coaching but i think that chess coaching mm-hmm. is a very very stable uh, profession and that any good chess player can fall back to at any point because at the end of the day i see chess as not just a sport but as a social tool yeah. uh, and it you can teach it in schools even now they they use it in some very very uh, interesting places like i saw fide doing a tournament for prisoners you know uh, mm-hmm. right now so you see it's a it's a tool and basically even if people talk about engines and alpha zero and uh, it getting solved and all of this you can always keep using chess to increase your patience concentration analytical ability so i think from that perspective chess will always become relevant uh, chess will always stay relevant and uh, the people who teach it will always have some kind of a job in hand. So I think it's it's not as risky. Like uh, if you think about any profession, which is going into a state where it will become stable, there are always these things which are shaky yeah? at the beginning, like who should get a job, what are the qualifications and stuff like that. And I think chess is moving through that phase. And maybe after a few years, We'll be uh, seeing chess players making a good living out of it. So we are passing through. We are into that phase right now where things are not stable. Well, yeah, I asked the niche. You said you listened to the. I straight up asked them I, in the first episode. Okay, we're all on on Twitter. Grow the game. Oh, this is great. Everything, but has the top level seen it? And he said, no, not really. Uh, which, in the back of my mind, I always kind of expected that. Pog Champs or COB, for example. COB is an incredible event. Pog Champs, great event. But a top Russian GM does not improve their life on these events because the same, or the top GM like in, in, in most countries, because this, the, it's the same ecosystem at the top. And um, the World Championship prize has been the same for two decades, if not more. I'm not a historian, but I know that in 2000, the prize fund was almost the same as it is now. That is crazy to me. Like, come on, people. I mean, what? And of course, there, you know, there, FIDE is obviously involved in negotiations as well. Like, there's blame to throw around everywhere. But I think Anish said that Fabiano said to him that in his world championship campaign, had he lost, he would make $450,000. That is life-changing money. I understand that. But we are talking about the second greatest player on the planet in any other sport. (laughs) It would be a joke. (laughs) So, you know, the worst player in most sports leagues gets paid double than that. And I understand, you know, TV rights, sponsorships, apparel. But... Yeah, maybe we do yeah. have to scale it for the for online. I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. I mean, uh, overall, like I agree with you on the world championship part, but I think that this boom, because of all that is happening, Queen's Gambit, Pop Champs, COB, 
is not for uh, nothing and i'm sure that the benefits of this will be witnessed uh, in the coming and i see it directly you know uh, like i have had so many meetings in the past year uh, of very highly influential people thinking about investing into chess uh, and you know trying to do an indian league trying to do something related to chess maybe set up an academy somewhere like for the top tal government Uh, itself putting out a program that it wants to support chess in some way and so the basic thing is that yes it's not materializing very quickly but the interest people are showing and that is because of the numbers imagine that pok champs yeah. didn't happen i mean and there were no numbers yeah. and so today i'm sure that even you would be getting a lot of uh offers or a lot of people wanting to collaborate not even ch- in chess field somewhere outside like oh would you want to promote this stuff on your stream and so on and i think it's uh, it's a direct uh, influence and later on let's say with let's say you have a lot of money and you say i'm going to do the gotham chess invitational for top players in the world maybe that's a benefit there from which which went from the lower ranks to right at the top but it it will happen i mean we need to be patient you kind of leaked one of my secret ideas you know i have a little <laughs> notebook of so yeah that 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 was one of them uh organizing tournaments also in in new york and just in the united states uh i i i had one really crazy idea which i will i will tell you now uh i i really don't don't mind uh but in in the united states i don't know how it works in in india but in the united states most of our open tournaments across the country are organized by one giant body like of course small clubs also organize their tournaments but in terms of open events where people travel we have an organization known as cca i don't know if you've ever heard of it continental chess association so they have decades long relationship because the the main guy who runs it is like in his 60s or 70s So he's known and spoken to hotels for 20, 30 years. So for the same weekend of every year, he gets some sort of discounted rate. And the business model is you have like six sections. You have, you know, under 1300, under 1500, 17, 19, 21, 23, open. And you pay for some foreign open players to come. Uh, and the lower rated players, you don't give them a huge amount of prizes, but they pay... the same entry fee as like an IM totally the same 100% like maybe a little bit more discount for the IM and so he makes money i mean the organizers must make a killing they also do side events and everything they pay td is like uh, okay wage for for like you know standard of living it's like okay it's not terrible but it's it, it's okay that's it one major organizing body you want to you want to go look at us chess tournaments you're going to find a little club somewhere you're not going to find an organization that or, that, that has tournaments all over the country wouldn't it be cool <laughs> if uh, a big youtuber of sorts uh made a tour similar to this and maybe donated half the money to charity or something like that and reinvested it into chess so this is one of my major projects down the line when tournaments kind of come back um like you know here in the united states grandmasters have to bring a chessboard to the game yeah 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 that's at insane. the world open right yeah 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 that's come yeah. on like that's ridiculous <laughs> it's like a, you basketball yeah, players need open. to bring the ball to the court <laughs> like uh, or you know cricket is the biggest sport in the you they got to yeah. bring all the equipment and like the, and the we're going to use my ball today you know or or however it's called like oh it's crazy man um so that no, actually i saw like Uh, what you did for you know even india uh, when there was this chess.com fundraiser i remember you donated 10000 dollars to to it right uh, and it just shows uh, that you, you are ready to reinvest back into the sport yeah and i think uh, this is uh, tremendous i mean the thing is there could be people who who are making a live, uh, making money out of this and who want to keep it for themselves maybe uh, do stuff for themselves but if you are even going to do some part of it that you are going to reinvest into the sport that is just phenomenal i mean you are you you are not obliged to right you you don't have to but you're thinking on those lines and indirectly it will also boost you further so it's like although it's a great thing to do 
it will also help you grow further and i think it's it's amazing that you are going to do that and uh, yeah. well, i won't i won't get super political people don't don't like it so much but uh listen i am a big believer in putting the money in the right place uh for some people that means their own wallet but i think i said this even when i spoke to samay and danny during that stream like i mean we'd be nowhere without the people like at the end of the day all this all this thing that we do we, we have a massive fan base and and if chess would not be the where it is now without the, the eyeballs and the people tuning in every single day and none of us would have had these consistent careers that we can now safely continue to scale if it wasn't for a show <laughs> if, if it was, obviously i'm not i'm not discrediting what you were doing but before all this uh, i was you know teaching chess okay i was like finding a career teaching chess and you were finding uh, everything that you were doing with chess base india but who can complain with a show like the queen's gambit so yeah, yeah but i think I, in uh, india like particularly it mm -hmm. was not the queen's gambit that brought in the numbers yeah the, the it was uh, the stand up comedians and uh, the overall chess boom happened because of some uh, major efforts by him biswa vaibhav all these people who spent really? a lot of time yes and the thing is yes queen's gambit uh, came some uh, it came towards like the mid or later 2020 right uh while they were at it from april so whenever uh, people talk about queen's gambit uh yes in major part of the world it's what has brought in the numbers but in india i think the stand up comedians have done a, a big more task, yeah. yeah because if wow. you look at their videos like maybe the first video of Samai, which got really popular with Vidit playing Alexandra Botez blindfolded and all. I think that was May 2020. There was no uh, nothing about Queen's Gambit. There are yeah. 23,000 people watching. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, and also, I mean, the thing is that there are so many elements that were in place that it has, you know, become right now into something really nice that we can continue doing it. Like Samai has brought in people, the comedians have brought in people, but now uh, there are viewers, there are players, there are young talents, there are tournaments to follow. So I think it's nicely set up to, to keep it going. You know, it's not, it was not just for that it happened and now it won't keep going. I would love to uh, say that it was not the Queen's Gambit, but for, for me, it was a major component. Oh. Of course, there was also Pog Champs and there was uh, collaborations with Hikaru and then, you know, I, I, four player chess when we did uh, with uh, Wolfpack and, and, and collaboration with Samay and everything. And, but uh, to summarize, like, I think I would much rather all the money I paid to the government I would much rather pay it for charities and help with chess or schools or like research and uh, the world would be a much better place if we could just make the rich give some of their money but unfortunately that's uh, that's just not how it goes but just for the record I'm still going to pay my taxes uh, I don't that's not saying I'm so yeah you know, you know one of the things that I've learned while running an organization uh, like I mean and is that it's very difficult to, uh, you know, bring about changes at a level which is going to keep on rolling con consistently. You know, like we can do things once, we can do things twice, but if we can set up a system, mm -hmm. that would be the best. And I think that is the challenge. And I think uh, when we, we speak about any organization let's say it's free day or the government or any of it what i have understood by running an organization is that it's very difficult to make certain changes in the overall scheme of things and it's very easy for like someone to say oh why don't we bring this change about and then something that changes yours affects something else over there so i just uh, of I don't know, uh, somehow this bringing a systemic change is what we have to strive for. And it's not easy. Yeah? Like if right now is the boom, we have yeah. to make sure that it keeps rolling. One question I was going to 
uh, end on. And this might even either be a really long answer or a short one, but uh, I, w I want to know a little bit about Sagar Shah outside of the world of chess. When I think of you, I think chess, you know? When I think of uh, some people, I think, I think only chess. So what, what, what is there we can know about you beyond the world of chess? That could be anything, or it could be, you know, what's, what, what are the next steps? Do you ever think about, like, what other interests or things you want to pursue once your time here is up? Will it ever be up? No, I think I've built up a life around chess in a way that I cannot get away from it. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, life away from chess, I haven't, not, nothing much. I am a very good badminton player. Uh, <laughs> I was, uh, when I was young, I played at the state level. Uh, and I think I still, whenever some chess player comes, like top players like Surya uh, and everyone who play with it, who play badminton, I still can uh, beat them at badminton. So, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I am a big advocate of badminton plus chess, you know, where they'll crush me in chess, but I can beat them in badminton. So that is what I like. Uh, I love reading books uh, overall, be it chess books or otherwise. Right now, I am in on this phase where I read a lot of uh, entrepreneurial books which help me to just understand what I'm doing, how I can improve. By the way, the books are strewn all over the house. One of the books that I'm reading right now is this No Rules Rules. Uh, or this is the Netflix culture. Then there's another book here, which I love a lot. Uh, it's called Atomic Habits. It's, uh, it's a beautiful book. Uh, and it's like the house is filled with several books. In fact, there's one more book which I want to show to the viewers because I think reading books has changed my perspective in life. Like one is this hyper focus. So mm -hmm. we always keep talking about, you know, how much can we concentrate? How much can we, uh, you know, you are distracted. Why don't you focus on your work? But how much are you actually scientifically able to focus on things? Uh, mm -hmm. Beautiful book, by the way. Uh, I recommend you to read this before you get married or, you know, uh, just anyway. The seven uh, principles for making marriage work. The thing is, the thing is that <laughs> I know, I know people are going to laugh at me and stuff like that, but uh, there were things in this that I said to myself, if only I had known this a few years ago, <laughs> I would have been a better husband. Yeah, you're still and... here. So you're still here, you know, <laughs> so it's never too late. And the yeah. la uh, this last book, which made a huge impact on me is this uh, line by Sam Harris. And the thing is that uh, it, it talks about why lying is so detrimental. I mean, the white lies that we talk about and all of that. So yeah, I think overall reading has opened up a completely new horizon. And the way I read books is that I don't take one and finish it. <laughs> I just open a few pages, read it, and we discuss together. Like Amruta and I, we discuss about it. We make notes about it, how we can wow. apply it and all. So it's like uh, every morning we have a one hour session where we exercise as well as read. And this is the part where I can use that knowledge in my other hours that I work. And this has become like addictive now because it's like, oh, this knowledge, oh, I didn't know. Like, for example, uh, let's say when Amruta and I argue and there's this book in which it's written, do not have a harsh startup, you know, when you fight. So we're like, oh, you did this. And we're like, oh, this is a harsh startup, you know, just slow down, you know, like make it a little softer and then so this knowledge is actually applicable in real world. That's what I realized earlier. Reading books was more like, oh, you read it. Where are you going to put it? And uh, that's what is made very addictive for us to, to read these books. That is amazing. I'm, gonna, I'm going to use that. That's good. Because we, I come from a family of yellers, not in an <laughs> in a angry way, but... You know, anything. We just, we yell it out and that's the, we don't say any insulting things, but we can, we can just be very loud to get a, you know, it's a, so that's, I'm going to, I'm going to try that next time. You know, I'm going to say, hey, let's just, let's just calm it down. Why? Your point is the same, uh, however the, the volume is, and let's just talk about it. I'm, uh, I like to, yeah, we're, we're, we're quite different, uh, but I like to, uh, sometimes it takes me a while to come to a reality like myself, you know? And it takes, it takes me, and then I have a breakthrough. I'm like, oh, I, I see it now. Like, I see it from your point of view. So I'm a little slow, 
Um, uh, sometimes I leave milk out for an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh, the milk is there. Okay, great. Then I text Lucy, is it still good? Or should I put it back? What do I do with it? So, um, yeah, but, but with, with arguments, I, I, I'm, I'm very big picture. So I, I'm like, listen, we're arguing right now. Like, I'm, we, one of us might be mad, but, you know, still love you. Like, I'm going to still be here, like, the next, like, however long we're going to stay alive, right? So it, it, it's not world-ending for me. So yeah. I, but, um, but I also am the kind of person I hate letting things sit, you know? Mm. I, I never understood how people do that. They're like, I can't, I don't want to talk about this right now. Give me like 30 minutes. I'm like, I have to sit here for 30 minutes with anxiety? What are you crazy? Like, no, let's like figure this out, you know? So it's, uh, it's a lot of balancing. I'm going to take yeah. you up on that book, so. No, no, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, well, I mean, seeing you, what I, what I have realized is that you kind of put things into action, uh, what you have. And this is really cool because even now, like, of course, maybe it was said in half uh, jokingly and stuff, but let's say if you learn something or if you grasp something, you want to apply it. And that's shown in your videos as well. Like if you see something very interesting, a game, you want to make a video out of it and you know, you, you do it really well. So that's, that's, I think your superpower there that you are able to, you know, grasp things and make some content out of it. But one question I had before we end is like, how do you come up with these interesting subjects for your videos overall? Like, uh, th does it strike you and you are like, okay, let's do it. Or you, you have this list of video and you're like, okay, pick the first one is done. Now let's do the second one. Uh, so I, ideas come to me, the whole process is actually fascinating. It, you, you might have a point when you say it's not superpower, but it's something I can't explain. Like I, I was trying to get my younger brother who doesn't, he, he's okay at a few things, but he's not great at one. Like well, my, my whole life I, I played chess. It was the only thing I did. I was terrible at everything else. It was, it was great at this and terrible at everything else, but he's like, okay, at a little bit of everything. So I was thinking to give him like advice on how to maybe do some TikToks with cooking. And I really struggled. I just, because in order to do a, things a certain way that, that, that I see them, you need, like I'm thinking of it in my voice and my expressions and my editing. And some of that is so difficult to convey, which is why people like some of these amazing people who do master classes, it's amazing content, like a Gordon Ramsay or some of these like act, you know, people who teach acting. So it's always, I don't have brainstorming sessions. I'm very disorganized a and I will just be sitting there and I go, oh, this is just a great idea. Like it just, it, I'm j I just think about it. Like some of my ideas, like the best queen sacrifices of, I don't know, I was just sitting there. And I thought about doing it. Like, I'll, I'll give you some. I mean, may, maybe um, some of these are not going to be crazy, like, impressive. But um, the best queen sacrifices by computers. And then, like, what I do is I... I haven't made this video yet, so if anybody wants to steal it. What I do is I think, what can be a good thumbnail? And what I realized is on YouTube, you have your temporary content, like your recaps, but you have your evergreen. So the content yeah. that does... You know, you have a vi some videos that get 20 million views. Every day they get views. So there's a formula for both and like I have to split it into two of them and I make the thumbnail first. And right now I probably have 20 thumbnails like in the vault. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> well, it's nice, but it's also I keep paying my graphics guy for new thumbnails, but I, I have this stuff in the vault. So, um, you know, it'll be like 10 chess questions or a roadmap of how to get better at the game. Uh, and, and I try to think of two or three every single day uh, and uh, some are easy. It helps to have series. So I have like a formula, you know, if I need to do a sponsor plug, okay, I need to do Guess the Elo because that's where I'm going to put the sponsor. Um, but I, I just really love it and I think I'm most, I think I'm just addicted, really. Uh, I've made a video every day for probably like a year and a month now. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's... this is, and, and they are all interesting. Like I think, okay, maybe uh, I, I sometimes say, let me see what uh, Levy is up to. And oh, today he's talking about some greatest ever uh, game filled with blunders, you know, like some 700 ELO <laughs> game that you have. Had. I mean, the thing is, that this is all like you are able to keep it exciting day after day. And this is uh, amazing. 
uh, does it ever do you ever feel like you know the the view count is important like oh on this video it had reached 400000 views and this one has only reached 200000 yeah. uh, i don't feel good about it does that happen to you yeah so uh uh i think um it it it's really bad sometimes actually because i'll have really high hopes and some nights i've stayed up till 3 in the morning uploading a video for seven in the morning the next day because that, that to schedule it and i wake up at seven because i always wake up at seven not because i set an alarm and i see the videos and doing well and uh i start maybe i should change the title and patience is such an important thing i've had videos climb from nine to two by the end of the day like nine of my last ten to two because it just takes people a little bit of time to get there and maybe the next video you put out doesn't hit the algorithm as fast. So some of the older videos are getting the views. It's bad. I've had to like really calm down. And there's days that I check my YouTube dashboard way too many times and try to interact with the comments and find which person said something terrible to me so I can put it on Twitter. We have like a nice little pipeline here of social media. Uh, and, but yes, absolutely. And, and it's really not good for our health, I think. Um, you just put it out there and you you hope that uh that it does that it does numbers i am very internally competitive like as i was climbing up um i do want to have the biggest chess channel like i i don't want it to be close i mean i, I want people to go to youtube and if they want to learn the game you know they, they they watch they watch saga first and then they watch gotham um but i, I don't want to at the same time, I don't want to be the big blob. Like you have two hours a day on YouTube, you're only going to watch me and nobody else because I really hope that it disperses out to other channels. Channels that aren't as big, but maybe upload one hour video reviews of an opening that I don't do. I, I don't like that content, an hour lecture on an opening, but they do, they, they do do that. And then they find their, their, their way to other places. So um, I, I guess that's, that's, that's the long-winded answer, yeah. but yeah, totally. I 100% I check numbers all the time and it's... yeah I think you have to care for it in order to keep on consistently getting those numbers like for example if you check uh, my channel Chessbase India I do not uh, think about these things yeah that's why some videos have 10k views mm. some have 15k views some will have 100k but at the end of the day uh, I realized that it is putting a too much pressure and that's why I find it amazing that you are able to, you know, clock those numbers day in and out. It, uh, I mean, all of you guys listening to this, it's not easy. I think it's very difficult what he's doing. I understand uh, because, you know, uh, there is sometimes so much energy needed to put the finishing touches to a video like, oh, you need to first analyze the game, bring them all together, the PGNs bring everything yeah. and then record it uh i don't know if you edit those records not also. not the recaps but i i i do like to have clean cuts and uh i i edit everything like right here and then i render it um yeah. i have i have video editing experience so it, it's not it's not super complex but even those like irl videos with the board on the screen i mean you know a lot a lot of work goes into that um yeah. and uh yeah i I, I like for it to be smooth. I think of how I want all the edits to be. And sometimes I'll record 75 minutes and the video ends up being 40 and I have to edit the whole thing. And that means watching the entire video. So, uh, but I, I love it. I do try to think of things that won't be boring. Some of my series content I know will slowly get views over time, the really long videos. Uh, but yeah, I try to constantly come up with interesting ideas. Uh, yeah. And that's actually why I stopped streaming because, well, as much. Streaming is not the best version of myself and it's not productive. It's basically me clicking a button going, I hope I get donations today. Like, that's really what it is. Because, yes, I can record some guests. The ELO, which is what I record a lot on stream. But the truth is, like, in that three hours, I'm just, I'm not super energetic. And when you think of... The, the, the work, if you have three energetic hours, the ROI on streaming is far lower than brainstorming several YouTube videos, recording one or two, working on a couple of projects I can't talk about now. Uh, and <laughs> so 
un- yeah, like I just feel there's just not enough hours in the day. I wish I had a clone sometimes. Like I, I really never um, thought I would. I would. You say need that, a team. But... You need a team. That I think if you have more people around you who would, who I mean, you will need to train them. At first, it seems impossible to replace what you are doing. I mean, not. I mean, teaching and you talking. That of course is ir- irreplaceable because you are the face. You are the thing, but. The other things, I'm sure uh, there will be people who will take care of it, and soon you will kind of have more time to yourself. But right, that's why I think. I mean, one year and one month is a long, long period, and all the people out there, you know, I I see in the chess world there are like two factions that are being created, which is one is like oh, going numbers and this, and the other faction of these grandmasters who are like you know oh, we need to make very very uh, high class chess content i think overall there is place for everyone but at the end of the day the, the amount of effort that goes into anyone who's popular is insane i mean it's you cannot become what you are without putting in that effort and i think that people have to recognize and i i have been seeing this that's what has impressed me to know and that you're able to do it consistently like if let's say you did it for a few months and then you said okay break and uh i want okay, to that, i want that, to yeah. that's what uh, many people do you know they come like uh with full force and then after a while they like okay now other priority but you are at it and uh, really i i respect that even at the classical chess tournaments, man, I was finishing the game in Vegas. It was pretty wild. Uh, I would play four or five hours. I would leave and I would get mobbed by people. Like there was, yeah. and I would talk to them for another 30, 40 minutes. And then I would slowly make it to the elevator. And then I would go upstairs and I would literally sit down. I tell my friends, this yeah. is what I want. Order it from the delivery app uh, and let's make a video. Yeah, it's... It's really nonstop. I've had days that are 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., you know, yeah. something like this. But so I'm preaching to the choir here because we we both know the grind. But sometimes uh, it, it can no, it can I seem mean, like we're just tiring. yeah, we can it's sort very of tiring. And I think you you need to break, take a break. I mean, at, at some point, <laughs> I know I know that uh, you don't want to break it because it's kind of it's working. You want to keep it going it's very difficult yeah, to take that break because then you are worried that, oh, it might, what if it breaks? And as you said, you're competitive. I, I you think have a it's book? A very difficult. You have a book Sorry. on taking breaks? <laughs> <laughs> Probably somewhere in the house, right? You have a book on like when you need to take a break. And uh... Uh, I, I think there's this uh, documentary on Bill Gates on Netflix. I don't know if you have seen it. And he speaks about uh, taking one week off where he goes into a retreat and he starts reading uh, things, just anything that he loves, books and all, kind of re-energizes himself and comes back and works. And I think that is true for everyone. And that's why when you are able to be creative consistently, that's very difficult because if you take a break, you become consi- uh, you become creative. Like breaks make you creative. But to keep on grinding and be creative, that's the tough part. So. I- yeah. I think I would lose my mind with anxiety if I had to live away with no contact for seven days. But that, that is true. Maybe that reset, that it's all about self-control at the end of the day. Um, yeah. So it, it's definitely, yeah, the mind uh, is... What's a, your age, Levi? 25. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why? So, I mean, <laughs> when you will reach 30, maybe you will you will uh, appreciate breaks a lot more. Uh, and I... I I think it's somehow uh, one thing that really impacts is the health. Uh, That is one thing which Mm -hmm. really makes you stop. And I have experienced it. And uh, I hope that I hope that you are not. uh, Yeah, if you if you have experienced it, I I hope you take it seriously because that is where I think really that puts things into perspective. Because you are like, oh my god. This is coming to my health and, oh, this video, if I don't shoot, I might, uh, my health could get better. And that's where at least things became slightly more normalized for me uh, in terms of work, you know, uh, but. 
if if that doesn't stop you then i well, i mean i don't know what to say i i might be more i would respect you even more but at some point i'll be like okay come on that's, no, that's crossing I, a limit i'll be completely honest with you uh the the one achilles heel i have is i have a slip disc in my lower back so i have a really bad uh, l5s1 disc and i first discovered this um when i was 16 in Spain, my grandparents took me to travel and I couldn't like get up, like it hurt to walk. Imagine I'm 16 years old and I can't walk. Like what, um, I mean, I understand people have worse, but it, so I had to get injections. Like they went to the pharmacy and they got B12 and syringe and stabbed me in the butt because like this is what a B, vitamin B12, like injection is apparently good for your spine. And a couple of weeks later it went away, injections or not, I have no idea if they helped, but. Uh, in 2019, I injured my back and um, it was terrible. It was, I couldn't get up out of bed, like pain shot through both my legs. And uh, I'm not, uh, this was 2019. I mean, I'm 20, I'm 21 years old. And luckily, knock on all wood in the world, in 2020, I had nothing. And 2021, I had nothing. And I was sedentary. I was the fattest I ever was because I was not working out. And I was sedentary and still somehow it survived. And then about a month ago, it slipped at the gym. Like I was not, I was moving in basketball and I knew right away. And it's like the most depressing pain. So that night I came home and I just fought it. Like I literally was screaming on the floor because I was getting up. I'm like, I, this can't happen right now. So I recorded the next like week of recaps in, in terrible pain, actually. Um, I can only sit a certain way, but the whole time I was trying to hang on the bar and flex my back backwards and, you know, and uh, it, it stopped. And now I'm like going to do everything I can to strengthen my body. But that's my Achilles heel. Yeah. If that thing doesn't work. Yeah, that's, I, that's what will stop you, I guess. But the thing is, I, I and you're working out, that's the best part. But there's one guy who can really uh, bring perspective in this and you know him and you've had him on this show. That's Anish. And uh, I don't know if you guys spoke about this subject itself, taking breaks and, you know, uh, kind of rejuvenating yourself. But I think I have had several discussions with him on this subject. And being the kind of player that he is, mm -hmm. the amount of preparation that he does, the level at which he plays, I'm surprised that he's able to spend so much time with his family, with, you know, taking the break, streaming and stuff. I think he has this right uh, balance of switching on and off. And I, I mean, someday if you get to speak on this exact subject with him, that would be really a good one for people to, to uh, learn about. I wish I, I wish it did a little bit better on that episode. I'll probably have him back, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and then be like, Hey, let's, let's do something slightly less, uh, less official or less interview sounding. Um, yeah. Sagar, I, I, listen, I want to say that um, I think I, I have experienced a massive range of emotions during this conversation, and I expected it to be good. I expected us to talk about a lot of stuff, but um, you, 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 you taught me some stuff and you made me think about things a different way. So I just want to say thank you because I, I, no disrespect to anyone else I've had on the show, but like I, I'm coming out of this with action items. You know, I want to do some things in my life as opposed to just chatting about life so thank you well i'm, I'm grateful to uh, for that and uh, i'm glad that we could do this uh, and and you know do it together um, i hope that gotham city channel also experiences the same amount of boost that gotham chess has but uh, levy uh, thank you for all that you've done for the chess world and yeah if if you continue doing this i'm sure that the the top level chess players will experience the benefits I hope so. of <laughs> I hope so going need, upwards so yeah need a need need a little bit of respect just a little bit <laughs> no, no, from, no. From, from from more <laughs> than just the niche maybe but uh, well, well, everyone everyone knows knows you what you do it's just that it'll everyone will start speaking I I mean I I think about that Firusha incident yeah when he spoke i think it was you mm. and anna rudolph there when mm -hmm. he became a G, uh what when he 
he was there he spoke about learning chess from agad mathur yeah and i guess that is a great moment for uh, agad mathur that uh, this is what happened and i'm sure that few years down the line uh, people will talk about you in that way the most inspiring thing to me now is obviously i get some fan mail about people uh, reconnecting with their older relatives yes. grandfather or something like that but i've also had photos of like dads with their little kid on their lap like watching the video like babies i mean like one month old or something so um yeah i love that stuff i i i will never get to a point i don't think where i'm like separated from something like that or or the people or but life is long uh yeah. and uh yeah. it i think that's the that's the summary of the day i to be honest i i've just enjoyed this so much i haven't even realized we've gone two hours but it's it's late and i i do need to sleep <laughs> uh, please please take care and uh i hope that uh you won't have a very tough time editing it i i no i have won't. any problems you, you can no, put no, no. everything that we spoke about but uh just thank you so much and levy uh, it was a pleasure Talk yeah this was awesome take care as always, thank you so much for making it this far in the video or in the podcast if you're just listening to the audio. Uh, if you'd like to support Chessbase India, you can find them on YouTube. You could, I'm sure they have many, many donation links. Uh, and if you're interested in supporting me or the show, you know what to do. I also have donation links uh, in all my various social media uh, as well as courses on my website. And uh, I'll see you next time back here in Gotham City with our next guest.